Good morning. We start with general questions and question number one, Ben McPherson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on how it plans to establish a permanent trade representation in Berlin. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. As announced by the First Minister on the 15th of October, the Scottish Government will create a permanent presence in Germany by setting up an innovation and investment hub in Berlin. Staff numbers and precise resource requirements, including the specific location in Berlin, will be determined as soon as possible. And Germany has been selected because it's at the heart of the EU with significant opportunities for enhanced collaborative working with Scotland in areas such as manufacturing. Ben McPherson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain further in what ways this initiative will build on the current positive relationship Scotland has with Germany, as well as positive relationships with other European nations? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I mentioned in the first uh, response to Ben McPherson, Germany is consistently one of our top five export destinations. It's a critical market for our tourism industry. And after the US and France, it's our third largest inward investor. Uh, Germany, as I've said, is also at the political heart of Europe. And the Berlin hub will allow Scotland to build on our existing relationships with European partners, and also, of course, vitally to increase trade and investment. Jackie Bailey. The First Minister's announcement of increasing trade representation in Berlin is welcome, but can the Cabinet Secretary tell the Chamber whether additional staff will be recruited for this purpose or simply transferred from other responsibilities within SDI, and whether there is additional money available, and if so, how much? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Jackie Bailey has referred to the statement by the First Minister in which she said there would be a doubling of SDI staff across the board. So the hub in Germany will uh, bring together staff from Scottish Government, from Visit Scotland uh, and from Scottish Development International. And of course, that will be uh, on the basis that SDI staff will across the board double in number, which should increase our presence. And it's worth saying, of course, that much of this is stuff which we'd be happy to do in any event, but which is increasingly important and urgent because of the <coughs> forthcoming consequences of the Brexit vote. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, one of the Berlin successes has been the huge level of investment that went into the, the reintegration of the eastern half of the city, including refurbishing older housing stock. Will any new trade mission have a remit to consider how such construction activity could actually benefit Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Berlin is obviously at the heart of the EU and it has significant opportunities for enhanced collaborative working with Scotland in areas such as manufacturing, as I've mentioned. But we'll also be exploring the potential in the priority areas outlined in our trade and investment strategy, including uh, digital technology, an area uh, raised at the National Economic Forum era this week with the First Minister, as well as high value manufacturing, healthcare and low carbon sector. We have been very proactive in making sure that we can increase our trade, as I say, not least uh, to try and make up for what we uh, foresee as the consequences of Brexit, but also to increase economic prosperity, uh, inclusive uh, prosperity here in Scotland. Question number two, Joan McAlpine. Sorry, microphone, Ms. McAlpine, just a second. A microphone for Ms. McAlpine? Ah, it's the card. <laughs> My fault. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making on implementing the recommendations of the report Chronic Pain Services in Scotland, where are we now? Minister Maureen Watt. The report, to which the member refers, was published in April 2014 by Healthcare Improvement Scotland and made a number of recommendations to NHS boards and the Scottish Government in order to help plan and drive improvement in pain services across Scotland. For the suggestions made of the Scottish Government, we provided support to the National Chronic Pain Improvement Group, formerly the, the National Chronic Pain Steering Group, which was tasked with overseeing work to take forward the relevant recommendations. Having addressed all of these recommendations, the group came to its natural end in March 2016. Additionally, for each board to establish the servant improvement groups referred to in the report, the Scottish Government made pipe, uh, pump pr prime funding available from 2012 to a total of 1.3 million for a two-year period. These groups considered those recommendations in the report directed towards NHS boards. Joan McAlpine. I thank the Minister for that answer and I welcome the fact that the new residential centre for chronic pain is up and running at Allender House on the Gart Naval campus but could perhaps be more widely publicised to the, the public. I note that the centre doesn't cater for children and that the Royal Hospital for Children Glasgow doesn't offer a residential integrated service on the par 
with that offered at the Bath Centre for Pain Services. I have a 12-year-old constituent suffering from complex regional pain syndrome who, in the view of her doctors, requires a residential course of integrated treatment that can only be provided in Bath. Can the Minister give me reassurances that where the clinical need is proven that we will continue to, se to send the small number of cases to Bath for treatment? Um, I thank the member for uh, her additional questions. Um, in terms of the publicity of the National Chronic Pain Management Programme, it's been uh, up and running at Garden Naval Campus since November 2015, and since then 121 patients have been repaired, referred from across Scotland. So I think the community in chronic pain uh, know about it, and the patient satisfaction of that programme has been at a very high level. In terms of the individual constituent who unfortunately suffers uh, from severe chronic pain, um, can I say that obviously I can't get into uh, patient uh, details, but uh, because of the, a very small cohort of children fall into that category, services will still be available at Bath if necessary. Question number three, John Lamond. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on plans to reopen rail stations at Reston and East Linton. Minister Hamza Yusuf. Uh, if the local authorities decide to proceed uh, with the stations, I've already advised that the Scottish Government will fund 50% of the construction cost for each station, subject, of course, to a suitable uh, business case being provided. The offer of a 50% uh, contribution is significant and consistent with the percentage of funding contribution offers to all other bids uh, to the Scotia Scottish stations funds for new stations. I've informed the councils that I'm considering their latest funding offer, uh, but I do remind uh, the member and others, of course, that the Scottish Stations Fund is finite and is very competitive with a number of applications needing to be considered. John Lamond. I thank the Minister for that answer. There are sources from within Transport Scotland which suggest that Transport Scotland does not want the reopening of these stations to take place. So can the Minister reassure me that this is not the case, and if it is, the political will of this government and the desirability of reopening these stations will ensure that these views are overridden? Minister. I, know, I, mean, I don't know what sources is he's referring to, so I can give you directly from uh, the Scottish Government that, of course, if the business case is there, if the councils are committed to it, which I'm sure that they are, uh, there is no lack of, or hesitancy from the Scottish Government whatsoever to see the opening of these stations. And that's demonstrated by putting forward a contribution, uh, a suggested contribution of 50%, which is in line with other station uh, fund bids that have come in. Uh, I am considering the latest uh, offer from the council. I will, will give them a response uh, in the next uh, few weeks, but certainly the commitment from the government is absolutely there. And I have to say, when I first convened this meeting, uh, in my new role, I was heartened by the cross-party support that there are for these stations. So a good campaign by local campaigners, cross-party support, commitment from the government, commitment from the councils. This can happen, but there is still a, a bridge that needs a, a gap that needs uh, bridged in terms of, of funding, which uh, I will consider. Question number four, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what the outcome was of the recent ministerial visit to Munich to discuss future trade with the EU. Minister Paul Pilhaus. Uh, this government is clear in its intention to stay at the very heart of Europe, not on its fringes. First Minister's recent announcement of a four-point plan to boost trade, including a permanent trade representation in Berlin, is testament to this. Two weeks ago, supported by SDI and David Scrimger of the British German Business Network, I led a tech mission to Munich involving four Scottish companies, EpiPol, Made Brave, Machines with Vision and Sunamp. The mission was aimed at promoting stronger economic ties between Scotland and Bavaria by exploring areas of shared interest. Uh, under the banner of Scotland Can Do, I was accompanied by key partner organisations driving our innovation ecosystem, such as Women's Enterprise Scotland, the Scottish Edge Fund, We Are the Future, MBM Commercial and Freer Consultancy. And my agenda include a very positive meeting with the Deputy uh, Minister President of Bavaria, Ilsa Agnier, who expressed interest in leading a return mission to Scotland next year and discussions with the Economic Ministry and the Municipal Authority in Munich as well. It also included a visit to the hugely impressive new IBM Watson facility in Munich, a meeting with a board member of BMW, meetings with Munich Technology Centre, uh, with the Fraunhofer Institute uh, to discuss their project on photonics in Glasgow and with Bewa Renewable Energy, the last two being leading German companies rooted in Bavaria uh, who have invested in Scotland. Uh, Follow-up actions from these meetings are being pursued, including capitalising on the 17 twinning arrangements uh, between towns and cities in Scotland and Bavaria. Colin Beattie. I thank the Minister for his response. 
Does the Minister agree with me that the trade hub to be established in Berlin underscores the Scottish Government's clear commitment to Europe? Minister. I, th I think it, it certainly does, Presiding Officer. I think this mission demonstrated there uh, remains a lot of goodwill towards Scotland and the EU, and specifically in Bavaria itself, uh, where, as I say, there are 17 existing twinning relationships. Uh, but the, uh, the, the, the establishment of the Innovation Investment Hub in Berlin shows a commitment to, as the Cabinet Secretary has outlined in his answer to Mr McPherson, a strong commitment to building on the links between Germany and Scotland and to exploiting uh, the very strong interest there is in Germany in investing in Scotland and indeed our existing economic links. Uh, more broadly, it will provide a base in which to further develop the German tourism market and to help raise Scotland's profile in Germany. Question number five, Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to review the report Scotland's Digital Future, a strategy for Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. The Scottish Government's commitment to refresh its existing digital strategy was detailed in the Programme for Government announcement. The refresh strategy will set out how we will take forward our digital ambitions under the vision of realising Scotland's full potential in a digital world and will demonstrate the role that digital can play in delivering this Government's priorities and ambitions for Scotland. Adam Tompkins. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that re reply. IT employs around 70,000 people in Scotland and con contributes about £3 billion to our economy. And the Scottish Government's own skills investment plan for the sector has identified that there could be up to 11,000 tech, uh, tech job opportunities every year uh, until 2020. But in recent conversations with business organisations in Glasgow, I've listened to numerous concerns uh, that business is finding it difficult to fill software jobs. Is the Scottish Government confident that our schools, colleges and universities are producing people who have the right skills to fit with the needs of our business? Cabinet Secretary. I think it's uh, a very fair point that Mr Tompkins raises. Yes, we will cover the issue of skills and education, the approach on STEM as well, uh, and ensuring that we're calibrating all our systems to support both the public and the private sector and in improving our capability as it relates to digital so that we can uh, release the potential in our country. Of course, we've got to make progress in connectivity, but skills and having the right people is absolutely critical, and we'll focus our attention on that when we refresh and publish our forthcoming strategy. Willie Coffey. Thank you. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how digital technologies will be used to improve the way in which public services are delivered and how this could help tackle digital exclusion? Cabinet Secretary. I think there's a fantastic opportunity to, to redesign some of our public services, to focus on the digital first approach, to be more effective and uh, efficient. And I think an organisation like Revenue Scotland has been very efficient in how they've adapted and created systems uh, around a digital first uh, approach. So you want a real customer focus, a once for Scotland approach and a calibration of our systems to be effective and efficient and serve the needs of our citizens and take advantage of the digital opportunities that are before us. Question number six, Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the annual value is of EU research programmes undertaken at universities in the Edinburgh area. Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. Our higher education institutions are active partners in a large number of EU research collaborations and have secured significant funding from EU research programmes as a result. The Scottish Government does not hold information on the financial value of EU research programmes for specific institutions. However, we understand that the universities in the Edinburgh area secured over £36 million from various EU sources, including the EU Government, charities, business and other sources in 2014-15. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the Minister for that answer. The Royal Society report into the role of the EU in funding UK research identified that the UK was a net beneficiary from EU research and development funding to the tune of €3.4 billion Euros in the period to 2013. Under the current EU R&D funding, total spending is expected to be €120 billion Euros in the period up to 2020, and it's anticipated that Scotland will win around €120 million a year in grants. Um, under the EU's 2020 Horizon Research Programme, and this may now be under threat following the Brexit vote, what assurances have been given by the UK Government that our universities will be compensated for any loss of research revenue? Minister. 
I thank the member for the question. The UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, Philip Hammond, provided a guarantee on the 13th of August that Horizon Research funding granted before we leave the EU will be guaranteed by the Treasury after we leave. And I welcome that UK Government guarantee on European funding, including Horizon 2020, as far as it goes, because what it doesn't take into account is the anecdotal feedback we're already receiving from higher education institutions about uh, collaborations and um, the, the Scottish research impact being told to take a step back from those research projects. It also doesn't take into account um, any of the future framework programmes that would happen in the EU, which we would have continued to receive benefit from had we stayed in the European Union. Question number seven, Alexander Stewart. To ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to tackle cybercrime in the light of the challenges faced by Police Scotland. Minister Annabel Ewing. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to working with Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority to ensure that the police have more specialists, such as experts in cybercrime and counter-fraud, and that the service has the right mix and numbers of staff for the future. Police Scotland is also developing its cybercrime infrastructure through the creation of a network of state-of-the-art hubs to ensure that knowledge and skills are maintained to a high level. Alexander Stewart. The Minister for her response. Would she agree with the Association of Scottish Police Superintendents that criminals have evolved faster than Police Scotland, exploiting advances in digital technology so that the internet is arguably the largest enabler for crime in Scotland? So what can I ask is the Scottish Government doing to implement these impacts? Minister. Uh, well, I, I, I would say to the member that, of course, uh, we are working uh, together with uh, uh, Police Scotland to ensure that they have the capacity to deal with the ever-increasing uh, challenges that cybercrime uh, present. And, of course, we are committed to ensuring that they have the necessary resources to do that. But I would say in terms of resources, two things. One, uh, of course, it is the case at the moment that Police Scotland is losing around £25 million per annum through the uh, VAT clawback on the part of the UK government and if the member cares about police uh, resources for Police Scotland he might want to get on the phone to his Westminster colleagues to get that money back to Police Scotland where it belongs and the second point I would uh, mention presiding officer briefly is that of course uh, a key uh, player in, in tackling cybercrime is uh, Europol and of course Police Scotland works closely with Europol on this important initiative and indeed other important initiatives such as uh, uh, child uh, trafficking and therefore I would also perhaps call on the member if he could also get on the phone to his Westminster colleagues to ensure that the UK government opts into the new Europol regulation yeah. to ensure that Police Scotland continue to have access to this key resource in tackling cybercrime. Question number eight, Linda Fabiani. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports veterans. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. The Scottish Government places great importance on veterans and their families. We have established a state-of-the-art national prosthetic service, committed over £5 million from 2015 for world-class specialist mental health services, and provided almost £4 million for veterans' housing. We have appointed a Scottish Veterans Commissioner, the first such position in the UK. I have also published a fresh strategy, renewing our commitments, setting out priorities on healthcare, housing and jobs. And earlier this month, I announced a partnership with Standard Life, bringing our Scottish Veterans Fund to total £600,000 over three years. We want the private sector to treat veterans as an asset to bridge skills gaps. And this week, I held a summit with Prince Charles to launch a new employers network. Linda Fabiani. I'm sure the, the Cabinet Secretary, like me, will welcome the one-stop shop for veterans which has recently been established in Lanarkshire. However, I have had correspondence with veterans concerned about already established and ongoing medical and respite services. Does the CAB Secretary agree with me that it would be useful to arrange that a rep of his government meet with me and those concerned veterans to discuss their experiences? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I would also welcome the new Veterans First Point Lanarkshire Service is one of seven new services established across the country, which of course is based on the award-winning uh, Veterans First Point Lothian model. Uh, Veterans First Point Lanarkshire is building an infrastructure of support for veterans within the local community by working in partnership with national and local agency. And our commitments to veterans is absolute, as we set out most recently in the Renewing Our Commitments document published earlier this year. Veterans should not be disadvantaged as a result of their service, and it's vital that they receive timely access to the services and support they need wherever and whenever they need it. And last night I attended with the convener of the cross-party group on veterans and the armed forces community uh, the 
launched by Forces in Mind of their report, which actually said, in relation to mental health services in Scotland, Scotland has arguably one of the most robust mental health and related health provisions for veterans in the UK. But it also pointed out, as Linda Fabiani has done as well, that we have to improve these services. And in that respect, I'm more than happy to arrange a meeting with uh, officials from the Scottish Government and the veterans that she mentions.